State Farm and DJ Dramos from Life as a Gringo know that getting your money right brings freedom, empowerment, and future success. The mindset work that it takes to retrain your brain to believe that you are someone who can obtain anything you want financially and hit all of those financial goals and that the only thing holding you back is is yourself. I love how she talks about like just demanding how much you believe you're worth, how much you want to make, and how you have to make that declaration. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. Let me run this by my lawyer is a really helpful phrase to have in your back pocket. Legal Shield has been giving legal peace of mind for over 50 years. They connect you to a vetted law firm in your state for an affordable monthly fee. Want an experienced set of eyes on a contract's fine print? Or you finally want to get that will done? Legal Shield has a dedicated group of lawyers who have your back, no matter what the future brings. Sign up today at LegalShield.com forward slash iHeart. PPLSI does not provide legal representation or advice. See a plan for for complete terms. You know that feeling when you walk into your home, take a deep breath, and feel new? Well, that's what it's like to use Clorox Sentiva. Because Clorox Sentiva smells like coconut, cleans like Clorox, and feels like energy. It'll elevate any cleaning routine to not just clean, but also make every room smell like a tropical coconut getaway. Discover how Clorox Sentiva's powerful clean and refreshing scents can transform your space. Get yours in coconut or other fabulous scents at a nearby retail store. You never want to find yourself out on the water fishing without the essentials. So it's best to always pack a Columbia PFG Solar Stream Elite hoodie to protect against the sun. I mean, it provides great protection and it's really breathable so you don't get hot. That's a win-win. Columbia PFG has a lot of great gear. So before you head out on the water, head over to Columbia.com slash PFG to shop their performance fishing gear. Welcome back to What's God Got to Do With It. I am so grateful to be sitting here with the Pastor Kevin Clean, head of the Cross Point Church here in Nashville. You guys are well acquainted with him from the episode before this episode, but you know, really, this conversation and this topic deserves its own conversation. So, you know, we talked a little bit last week about how I dipped my toes into Christianity, as I called it. And really, it was this, it was a a trying on. Everything I did was just trying something on, see how it resonated. And I couldn't deny what it was doing in my head, my heart, my brain, my soul. And that's really what kept me going. And now I know that was just God doing what he does. So we're going to talk about You know, I jokingly say getting to know this guy called Jesus, because that's literally what it felt like to me starting a new relationship. When you're when you meet anyone new in your life, you got to get to know them. Right. So there's the practical side of it. And then there's the spiritual side of it, the part that is hard to describe. And then obviously I wasn't on my own. I was being guided. I was being led. I was being pastored or as I like to call Kevin, he's my rabbi (laughs) and We're going to dive into that intersection, really, where, you know, the logic and the reason meets the spiritual, meets the soul. So let's just dive on in. Yeah, let's go. Yeah. So we um, will pick back up where where we met, which is at that Tuesday. And what do you remember about that Tuesday prayer? Do you you remember our first meeting? I remember I remember us meeting and I just I think it's wild that we met at Tuesday prayer. So when when Rhea and I, when our family moved up to pastor at Cross Point, it one of the first things we did was we created a Tuesday prayer time for the staff and for some people in the church. And so for you to walk through the doors at a Tuesday prayer, like you were jumping in the, like you were jumping in the deep end. You know, you're like, I dipped my toes in. No, you jumped, you jumped straight up in the, uh, in the deep end of the pool. And so, uh, so I was, I, I was intrigued. And I just think how, how interesting of God to lead you to 
to that place to have that experience as one of the first things that you, you know. Yeah, I had no idea that it was a big deal. I mean, I just, I heard about the Tuesday prayer and I was like, okay, I'm going to go to that. And I had no idea that it was this very intimate space. And I'm so glad that, I mean, that was a God thing, just leading me to walk through those doors. Yeah. And that was, that's really the heart behind that Tuesday prayer is to pray for, you know, we pray for renewal and that people experience renewal, people experience the life of God, revival for people to have a sense of awakening. And I'm like, your story is is a poster for the kind of things we were praying for in the city. And so we talk a lot about for the one and that God would do, you know, for Jesus talks a lot. Actually, Jesus talks a lot about, you know, doing things for the for the one because we can be overwhelmed with the needs of the world. Yeah. You know? But then we go back doing um, do it for one, what you'd want to do for everyone. And I just, I, I find it interesting that the thing we were praying for, this this renewal, this like sense of revival, this awakening that we're praying for, like you were the one, you know, that uh, that he, he worked in. And there have been other people as well, but it was just so clear that he was just at work in your life, drawing you to himself and, and revealing his love to you, you know. Oh. It's just fun to watch. It really oh. is, yeah. Thank you so much for saying that and being a part of it. And it's interesting because that first Tuesday, it was about a year later that I ended up giving my life over to the Lord and then ended up in, you know, that scene in your office with the $500. And and the cool thing is, is that what we're going to be talking about today, it kind of unfolded in real time. You know, I had to dip my toes in. I had to try on kind of one concept at a time. And what happened in those Tuesday prayers is you know, you got to kind of have a picture of what I was dealing with or or in, you know, conversations afterwards, I, you know, you'd ask me for updates. And, and part of it was that, and maybe you didn't even know specifically what I needed, yeah. but it always got it. I remember coming back from those Tuesdays and just being like, wow, I got exactly what I needed. Even though, again, sometimes at the beginning, I would just sit and kind of cry and surrender. But what I'd love to do, and, and you're so gifted at at this because it's it's really what kept kept me going and 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 really picking up what you were throwing down, so to speak, on and Tuesdays and Sundays. But practically, you know, some people might be thinking, okay, I want to either enter into a new relationship with God, start over, maybe recreate an existing one, um, renew my mind, wh- wherever they are, right? I had my practical steps, but I'd love for you to walk alongside these steps and kind of share what it looks like through your eyes. And so the first step was when I, again, I jokingly call it dipping my toes in because that's what I felt like I was doing. And now we know it was a deep end dive. But the first step was first, I had to try on this story that there was a man, Jesus, right? That there was this man from Nazareth. And, you know, because I didn't believe and I had all that skepticism in the way, I had to just suspend my disbelief about any of the faith, spiritual, higher power side of it, right? Right. And just come and meet my brain in the logic and reason of like, okay, there's this guy named Jesus. And if I have a hunger for history and learning, let's learn about him. So first I learned about Jesus. So can you just kind of meet us there and share for anybody dipping their toes in in that side of it? Yeah, I think I think I would even want to back it out a little further than that. I, I was Henry Nowen said that um, that nature is God's first language. Yeah, and so I think there comes a moment when you look around or when you look up at the night sky. You know, I was out in Wyoming and you know hiking up a mountain a couple of weeks ago. It's just like you have those moments where you realize this is so much bigger than than me. And we all have those moments in a in a different way. But I think. You know this this awareness of of the vastness of creation, and so when you think about the cosmos, then all the way down to the cellular level of our you know bodies and the way that we're put together, to realize like life is a miracle, you know. You know, scripture talks about that we're made in the image of God, and so when you look at the way that we've been, you know, crafted and created, I think it really begins at that place where our our hearts are longing to know more. There there comes a time where we're like, there's got to be more to this mm. than just what I can what I can see. And so I would say like that that spiritual hunger mm. it begins at that place of of longing to know more, and that can send people in a lot of different a lot of different directions, right? The spirituality. I think if you ask a lot of people, you say, you know, are you a are you a spiritual person? I think a lot of people would say yes, but I think there's the acknowledgement that I am spirit because God has made us mind, body, soul, spirit. Mm. You know, we have spirit. And so when we begin this you know, journey toward Jesus, who is, you know, who we would say is the God man, is fully, fully God, fully human. One of the words Jesus used for his son of Adam, 
you know, and the or son of man and son of God. Which to hear that, to be new to the faith journey or even new to new to Christ can sound like this really far out there, you know, idea. But I think when you begin to go back and historically, like who is this this person, Jesus? So we go back to our calendar and we're like, okay, our calendar is split you know, by the life of a man named Jesus. And I think then going back to go, if, if the calendar is split by his life, who was he? Who did he claim to be? You know, what were the claims that he made? What's been the impact of his life? When we go back and we go, historically, what can we know about his life? And so I think beginning in that historical place, I remember we talked earlier on, and you were like, you know what, I'm, I, I thought of Jesus as the Easter Bunny. <laughs> you know? And it's like, well, let's look at the differences between Jesus and the Easter yeah, Bunny. And that's, a, that's, there. that's the, like, that was yeah. the honest place. That's where you were at. And so beginning to walk back and go, what can we know? You know, I have so much respect for for Judaism and for, you know, Jewish faith and for Jewish, I mean, Jesus was a Jew. And so I've had this hunger to know more about Judaism since, I would say probably back in 2000 and probably about 2005, you know, where I really started to study and pick up books and pick up the Mishnah, you know, and I was just, I wanted to know, wanted to know more, wanted to discover how all of these things connect with the life of Jesus. And I just wonder if maybe God didn't put some of those things in place, like for you, you know, if that was, because I think he's a for the one kind of God. And so we met in that baseline of going, who is Jesus historically? And what does his life, what does his life mean? And really, I think to encounter him in what we would call the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. So these are eyewitness accounts of Jesus' life, historical accounts. One of them is written by a, a historian. Luke, who's giving a historical perspective, he also wrote the book called Acts. So it's Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. Acts is Acts of the Apostles. It's a historical account of the early church. So for somebody who's wanting to dip their toes in, you know, I think to meet Jesus in the Gospels, which would be those four historical accounts, and looking through and looking at the way that he interacted with people, what's interesting is almost half of each one of those books tells the story of the death, burial, and the resurrection. So what was so important about that, that each one of those authors spent so much time going, you got to take hold, you know, and Paul talks about there have been 500 eyewitnesses of the resurrected Jesus. And, and so there are these, there's something that happened, you know, in those, in those three days that changed these people's lives and that has changed history, changed our calendar, right? So, so I think, Letting that historical, the historical reality of Jesus draw you into that place of like, okay, I want to know more. Christianity is not turning off our logic brain. Like it's not turning off logic. It's, a, it's our hearts becoming awakened to truth and to seeking truth out. And that's what I saw in your story. Yeah, it's so good what you just said. And, you know, I think too, one of the things that helped me really solidify, and, and we use this distinction of the Easter Bunny versus Jesus, or not versus, but in mm -hmm. relation to, and it's no disrespect. It's just, you know, when you hear something and you put it in a category of like this fantasy or this, you know, I don't know, a symbol or something, it's it's hard to come back from that without, again, meeting your logic and reason brain. And I remember one of the things I did is I watched the movie, and I know it was a book first, yeah. but A Case for Christ. Yeah. And one of the things that I really gleaned from that movie is that all the historians and even the atheists, right. there was no discrepancy. Jesus was a man. Yeah. I mean, that is the data, right. you know? So again, we're just, I, I, that's one of the first steps I had to take was just start there, mm -hmm. you know? And then that's what led me to the second step was I started learning about his character, <laughs> right? The heart and soul and the spirit of this man called Jesus, you know, and I learned you know, through the Gospels, through the stories of the Bible, um, and just, you know, people that follow Jesus, hearing their their depiction of these stories, right? But, the you know, who did he hang out with? Who was he discipling? Who did he not just disciple, but who did he outright seek out, right. you know, to find and, you know, and help and pour into? And I learned about how he treated people. And what really stuck out to me was how he treated, you know, the air quotes broken, the the outcasts, the people that that were, you know, from society's standpoint, you know, meant to be a recluse or whatever, shamed, any labels that were given in, in olden times. But I learned about how he treated 
especially those people. You know, it was one of those things where I tried it on and I was like, wow, like if that's how he treated the people that have done X, Y, and Z, then, and, and not that it's a comparison game of like, oh, my shame isn't as bad as somebody else's shame, but we as humans, we do that. Yeah. You know, we ca categorize and m maybe put our, our shame on a hierarchy of, is it redeemable? Is it forgivable? Is it worthy of being seen and loved and known and all of these things? And maybe we don't even know that we're doing it. Mm -hmm. The flip side of being self-aware and all of the, you know, the personal development work I had done, I ha did have a heightened awareness of my shame. So this second step for me was probably the most important part. And again, I was just getting to know yeah. this guy called Jesus. And one of the things I remember is I was like, I've never met anybody like this. I, mm. I still, to this day, haven't met anybody yeah. as amazing yeah. as Jesus. So can we walk through that? Are you tired of your scented cleaning products smelling and cleaning like meh? Then it's time for an upgrade with the power of Clorox Sentiva. With an uplifting scent that smells like coconut, Clorox Sentiva gives you powerful clean like Clorox, but a feeling like <sighs> being transported to a tropical island retreat. Imagine putting your phone on Do Not Disturb, tuning out all the constant, just the feeling of warm sand in between your toes and a fruity drink in your hand. The ones with the little umbrella. Refresh your home to feel like an all-inclusive vacation by getting Clorox Sentiva. Also available in grapefruit and lavender scents at a nearby retail store. You're probably careful with your personal information, but what about the other places that have it? Like the doctor's office that mixed up your files. They have your social security number. The power company that mistakenly cut your service has your payment info and last three addresses. And the hotel that lost your reservation has your passport info. Your information is in endless places out of your control. Any one of them could accidentally expose you to hackers and identity theft through lax security, breaches, or simple mistakes. But LifeLock monitors millions of data points every second and alerts you to a wide range of threats. If your identity is stolen, a U.S.-based restoration specialist will fix it, guaranteed, or your money back with plans covering up to $3 million for stolen funds and expenses. Mistakes happen. Don't let not having protection be one of them. Save up to 40% your first year at lifelock.com slash iHeart. That's lifelock.com slash iHeart to save up to 40%. Terms apply. Hi, I'm Cindy Crawford, and I'm the founder of Meaningful Beauty. Well, I don't know about you, but like, I never liked being told, oh, wow, you look so good for your age. Like, why even bother saying that? Why don't you just say you look great at any age, every age? That's what Meaningful Beauty is all about. We create products that make you feel confident in your skin at the age you are now. Meaningful Beauty, beautiful skin at every age. Learn more at MeaningfulBeauty.com. Zero Foxtrot isn't just a brand, it's a way of life. Founded and operated by veterans, Zero Foxtrot's unique apparel and gear echoes the grit of the warrior culture. Zero Foxtrot dedicates itself to producing content, honoring the sacrifices of forgotten heroes of the past, and connecting history to the present. Embark on a journey with Zero Foxtrot today at ZeroFoxtrot.com. It's not merely our products, it's about the ethos that we embody. Rugged, resilient, and timeless. And one of the things I remember is I was like, I've never met anybody like this. I, mm. I still, to this day, haven't met anybody yeah. as amazing yeah. as Jesus. So can we walk through that? Yeah. So when you talk about, when you talk about character, you talk about like the ways of, of being, you know, and you look at Jesus' life. Let's just take, let's take Matthew, for example. So Matthew, who wrote the first gospel account that we have in the New Covenant, we read into, into Matthew and he, he tells us, it's interesting, we, we you start reading the book. And it starts with a genealogy, and then it tells the story of, of his birth. And then it moves to Jesus' ministry begins, and Matthew writes himself into the story about when he met Jesus. Now, Matthew was a tax collector, which in that day would have been like a, like a crime boss. He was a shady character, and in that day, tax collectors were lumped in with swindlers, with thieves, with murderers, and they couldn't worship at the temple. Mm -hmm. they, could, they were barred from the synagogue. 
and it says that Jesus is walking along. He's got a couple other disciples. So he's got, and he's got Peter. He's already called Andrew, Peter, James, and John. Peter was a zealot. So the reason that Matthew, the reason that he was hated in that day is because he had sided up with the Romans with their tax, their heavy tax. So Israel was an occupied state, Rome, heavy taxation. They wanted to take as much as they could out of, out of Israel. They taxed them for everything. Well, a tax collector would basically with the enforcement of the Roman army, they would be able to tax their brothers and sisters. They would be able to tax their fellow Jews and they would add on top of that. And so they were, they were hated because they had tied in and colluded with the enemy. So Jesus goes to, he's got Peter, Andrew, James, John, and he goes to, to Matthew and he says, come follow me. So this man who is despised and hated in that culture, he says, I want you to be one of my Talmudim. I want you to be one of my disciples. I want you to be my inner circle. Now, in that day, for a rabbi to ask somebody to follow is essentially saying, I believe that you can be like me. Right? So he's like, he's, he's, he's called Peter, who was a zealot, who basically wanted to take up a sword and fight the Romans. He's taken this zealot and he's pulled him in the group with this one, the one who has sided up with the Romans. And this is... I mean, if you're trying to build a team, like this doesn't seem like a, like a very wise thing to do, but this is, this is Jesus' heart in that it's only through Jesus that through his love, he was, he's like, I'm going to teach you guys how to love. I'm going to teach you guys how to be together. I'm going to teach you what unity looks like. And he invites them into this small group, and he brings 12 into this small group, and we just see the character of Jesus, and he loves them. I mean, these guys were knuckleheads, you know, just like us. They, they made bonehead moves. Yeah, and he he loved them and told them the truth, even when it hurts. And he took them, he stretched them outside of their comfort zone, led them into places that they into Samaria and into you know these interactions. And when you read through the Gospels, you just see you see the the characteristic of Jesus's love in First Corinthians, which is another book. It's a it's an epistle that the Apostle Paul, who was a leader in the early church, that he wrote to a church at Corinth. And the Apostle Paul talks is talking about love. And maybe you've heard this at like a wedding or before, but he talks, he talks about love. Love is patient. Love is kind. He talks about and all those things that we read are true of Jesus. In fact, later on, it talks about the fruit of the Spirit. Paul, in another letter, he says, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. When you talk about the character of Jesus, we see the love of God on display. Joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. I think about my life, I don't necessarily think of all of those, but I know that, that that is the kind of character that, that I want. Mm-hmm. And I think that's what he's forming in me. But those words are the character, character of Jesus, and we see those in the high definition as we read through the, the story. And the, the, you know, let's, as we move to the cross, Jesus said one time, he said, greater love has nobody than this. Then he would lay down his life for his friends. And so Jesus reveals sacrificial love. He shows what it means to, to sacrifice, which is the ultimate, right? To, to give your life for somebody else. So it's like all the other chapters lead up to this chapter. You say, I'm about to show you truly what love looks like to lay down your life. And doesn't stop there. He, you know, continues with the resurrection. But, but that, is the, that is the gospel is the sacrificial love of, of Jesus. That's the good news. When we say gospel, that's what that word means, good news. Like it's good news that, that we are loved that much. Like we are, we are loved that much that Bolton, my son, my youngest son, he used to have this, um, this little lion and he can, took it with us wherever we went. And we'd go, if we would go out of town, sometimes he would leave, like leave it at the hotel or the people we were staying with. And I mean, it was, it smelled, it was raggedy, it was falling apart, but if he left it somewhere, we would turn around the car and drive back. The value of lion, it wasn't in how lion looked. It wasn't in how, what, what we can get from lion on the black market. Right? <laughs> the value of lion was the love that was given to lion from Bolton. The value that we have doesn't come from our performance, doesn't come from how good we look, doesn't come from how well we have it together. It's loved into us, and the cross is the picture of how much we're loved. That's why we call it gospel. That's why we call it good news. Mm-hmm. That's the character of God that we see through Jesus.
So good. Yeah. And I think, you know, for me, this was th- that unconditional love, that love, even in the places where I didn't think I deserve it, or that kind of love that you're like, yeah, I'm lovable, except if the only they knew that, or they would see how broken I really was, or how much toxic shame is there, or how unworthy I am, or what if they find me out, then they really won't love me. Yeah. And it's like, no, yes, even those places, especially those places, that's the love that's available. And to me, what I remember thinking about this is because, again, I was meeting myself where I was in the work that I do with the women that I work with. We talk about, you know, self-image and identity. And one of the things that we build is their their inner compass. And mm-hmm. really, it's this aspirational thing. It's almost like breadcrumbs to lead them back to who they want to be yeah. when they feel like they're falling short. And one of the things I always say to them, I'm like, it's not this new gauge of perfectionism. It's not one of those things where you look at your inner compass and you're like, oh, great, I'm not being that. So great. There's another thing I failed at. It's this aspirational thing that you that you choose who you want to be really in the essence of who you are, stripped of all the roles, stripped of all of, you know, who like not you as a mom, not you as a wife, you as a as a woman, the soul, the essence of who you are. Mm -hmm. And to you have breadcrumbs to come back to who you want to be. And when I started learning about the character like you said you're like all of these things you know when i'm humaning in my day-to-day life i'm not all of those things but that's why we have this picture of jesus because it's this aspirational thing to not thing concepts ways of being elements of our identity of of character that uh, oftentimes we don't actively choose Mm -hmm. and so unconsciously or subconsciously we are not showing up with all of these fruits of the spirit and that's where the shame lives because we can't we know that we're not showing up as it but we can't put our finger on it right. and what i loved about you know especially in the gospels and what when you hear about this picture of jesus it gives you language it gives you a picture it gives you a man yeah. to show you what this looks like walks like acts like talks like and to me that was everything yeah i i think when we see it's it's aspirational it calls us to more yeah but even more than that, like the beauty of the gospel is, is who, and I, I've watched this in your life, man, is, is you becoming who you already are in Christ. Mm-hmm. So when you receive the truth of Christ, when you receive, who, when you put your trust in him, he says, it, it, the scripture talks about if anyone's in Christ, they're a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. So we've received this new, this new identity, and I've watched you live into that into that new identity. And so the transformation, because what religion is, religion is it's behavior modification from the outside in. And what true authentic spirituality in Christ, what being a follower of Jesus is, we receive his, like his spirit at work in our, in our lives, in our hearts. And it's a change from the inside, inside out. Yeah. It's a miracle. My, my, my values change. My, my, Attitudes change, uh, understanding change. Like there is this, it's, it's a transformation. That word, it's like a metamorphosis. Like the Greek word goes back. Like it is this, it's this shaping for the inside. But it's it's slow. It's a process. Right. You know, it it takes place over over time. But it's beautiful to beautiful to see. Yeah, and I, I you touched on something really important because I think a lot of times faith and spirituality and even Christianity gets batched in with that you know kind of religion talk and. One of the things that um, when you learn about Jesus' character, and he he talks about the new laws and the yeah. old laws, the Old Testament, the New Testament. And I remember I came up to you one of the times I met you at first. You were like, yeah, if you ever have conversations, you know, about the Old Testament, New Testament. And I was like, honestly, I don't really know much about the Old Testament. And I think I, it's because growing up, I was so like kind of turned off. And mm-hmm. now, obviously, I read the Old Testament. I'm like, oh, my gosh, there's so much wisdom there. Yeah. But it, it, in a way, it's like incomplete, yeah. right, without hearing about the picture of Jesus and what what is a, what's possible for us without yeah. these laws. So can you share a little bit of distinction? Because I know for a fact, because it was there for me, there's people that are listening. They're like, no, religion off limits because it, it has that stigma. So like, and one of the things I always say is like, I'm not religious. I'm I'm spiritual. I'm faith based. And I'm a Christian. Mm-hmm. There is that kind of gray area where people don't understand that. Can you share a little bit about your thoughts between like religion and spirituality? Are you tired of your scented cleaning products smelling and cleaning like meh? Then it's time for an upgrade with the power of Clorox Sentiva. With an uplifting scent that smells like coconut, Clorox Sentiva gives you powerful clean like Clorox, but a feeling like... 
being transported to a tropical island retreat. Imagine putting your phone on Do Not Disturb, tuning out all the constant, just the feeling of warm sand in between your toes and a fruity drink in your hand. The ones with the little umbrella. Refresh your home to feel like an all-inclusive vacation by getting Clorox Sentiva. Also available in grapefruit and lavender scents at a nearby retail store. Hi, I'm Cindy Crawford, and I'm the founder of Meaningful Beauty. Well, I don't know about you, but like, I never liked being told, oh, wow, you look so good for your age. Like, why even bother saying that? Why don't you just say you look great at any age, every age? That's what Meaningful Beauty is all about. We create products that make you feel confident in your skin at the age you are now. Meaningful Beauty. Beautiful skin at every age. Learn more at MeaningfulBeauty.com. Zero Foxtrot isn't just a brand. It's a way of life. Founded and operated by veterans, Zero Foxtrot's unique apparel and gear echoes the grit of the warrior culture. Zero Foxtrot dedicates itself to producing content, honoring the sacrifices of forgotten heroes of the past, and connecting history to the present. Embark on a journey with Zero Foxtrot today at ZeroFoxtrot.com. It's not merely our products. It's about the ethos that we embody. Rugged, resilient, and timeless. Tired of restless nights? Meet Lisa, the sleep expert. <sighs> Here at Lisa, we know that good sleep is essential for mental, physical, and emotional health. That's why their mattresses are made for exceptional comfort and support, catering to every sleep need. Check out Lisa's Sapira Hybrid Mattress, named best hybrid mattress five years running. Sleep hot? The Chill Collection is built with cool-to-the-touch top fabric and layers of high-density comfort foams, all intended to remove excess body heat while maximizing comfort. With Lisa, getting a new mattress has never been easier. Delivery is free, and you have 100 nights to try out your mattress in the comfort of your home. Don't spend another night dreaming of better sleep. For a limited time, save up to $700 off select mattresses plus two free pillows. Go to lisa.com forward slash iHeart for an additional $50 off mattresses and select goods. That's l-e-e-s-a dot com forward slash iHeart. Exclusions apply. See lisa.com for more details. Can you share a little bit about your thoughts between like religion and spirituality? Yeah. So I think, you know, one of the ways that I've, Started explained is that it's not about a religion; it's about a relationship. And so I think that's a helpful distinction: is that it really is a, a relationship, a personal relationship with the living God, yes. not with a man-made system. Now, some would think of religion this way, like that it's a ladder that I have to try to climb up to get to God. Where we look at what happened in Christ through the incar- yeah, incarnation through. With incarnation, what that means is God sending his son, the father sending his son, Jesus, God becoming man, living among us. That's what I'm sorry, like that, but that term, but that's a helpful idea to take in and go, that is God coming to us, you know, and not us trying to earn our way to God because it's impossible because he's a, he's a holy, perfect God. There's a story that Donald Miller told, and it's about a Navy SEAL who was going overseas to try to rescue some hostages. And the hostages had been in a difficult situation, and they were so traumatized that when the Navy SEALs came in and, and, and went into the room in the middle of the night, they tried to get them out. They wouldn't leave. They were huddled over in the corner. And one of the one of the soldiers, um, they were trying to you know, get them out with a sense of urgency, and they, they again, they were just they were traumatized. They were stuck at the corner. And one of the soldiers had an idea. He went over and he went and he sat next to one of the prisoners and he went and he got like in a fetal position, kind of held up right next to him. And he whispered to him, we're here to rescue you. We're Americans. We're here to rescue you. He just waited. He said it again. He waited. He said it again, just whispered to him. And pretty soon they believed. Yeah. And they were like, let's go. And they, they rescued the. And I think when, when you look at the life of Christ, when you look at Jesus, he's come to a traumatized, you know, humanity. And we're traumatized for a lot of different reasons. We live in a broken, tragic world filled with uncertainty. But God wants us to be certain of his love. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So much that he, that he sent his son to come in. And what we see in the life of God, he made himself vulnerable. Yeah. yeah. He came alongside us. 
And sometimes religion can lead us traumatized. Yeah. Sometimes religion is used to control, how to control people because we're afraid. Yeah. Right. And so sometimes religion is used. Sometimes religion is used to try to manipulate. Sometimes religion is used. Now, sometimes religion comes from a place of just authentic. I think we want to be, you know, live moral lives. You know. So, so when you look at the Ten Commandments, like Ten Commandments are wonderful. They're a gift from God, but none of us can. I mean, who listening has never lied? Like. We can't fulfill. And Jesus said, I didn't come to do away with the commandments. I came to fulfill them. Jesus is the only one. We needed somebody to fulfill them. You see, I didn't come to him to abolish the law. What the law does is it reveals to us that we are in need of a rescue. Yeah. There, there's no way we could do it on our own. And so the, when you look at like the Old Testament, when you look with the, the scriptures, the Torah, it reveals our need for Christ and then Jesus came to fulfill that, to live it perfectly, and to lay his life down as a sacrifice for us who couldn't get there on our own, who couldn't climb the ladder, who couldn't, mm-hmm. who couldn't do it. So, you know, I think when I, I, I just draw that distinction, it's not about religion, it's about a relationship. Mm-hmm. And oftentimes religion is trying to climb our way to God, in our own effort, um, perfectionism, and realizing there's no way we can get there on our own, you know, that he's come for us. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think the version that you just shared here that spoke to me back in the day when I first came to the Lord was this love and this, you know, relationship that I have right now yeah. that I don't have to earn. I don't have to hustle for it. I don't have yeah. to lose weight. I don't have to earn more money. I don't have to be in a relationship. It just meets me where I am. He comes to me yes. and I have to meet him too, yeah. <laughs> you know? But it's not this, it's not, I don't have to earn it, hustle for it, or, um, you know, be forgiven in terms of like, he's mad at me and I have to do a certain thing to earn my way back. Right. It's not like that. It just, it's here, it's now. And yeah, we need, we need that rescuing because we are human and we are not perfect. And that's the kind of relationship I want is with a God who's like, you're not perfect and I love you yeah. in all of your imperfections, that's it. you know? Yeah. So Beautiful. I love it. And then, you know, the big thing that kind of rounded this out for me that I want to walk through is this, you know, these are my words, not God's, right? But there was this kind of trade-off that I was experiencing or that kind of revealed itself to me as I was exploring this idea of following him, right? Because first, again, tried on this idea that there was a man named Jesus. Okay, cool. Check, right? The character of him, wow, like fell in love with this man named Jesus. Check. But following him, giving my life over to him, that was a process. My heart needed to be worked on a little bit. You know, it needed to process. It needed to try these things on. But the big part of it was that try on was a kind of a series of actions and a leap of faith. And it came in the form of this last part, which is trying on this idea of like, okay, there is a payoff or like a, a trade off, so to speak, right? So if I'm giving up something, what am I getting in return? And when I say giving up, I'm like giving up my shame, giving up my need to control, giving up my desires for perfectionism, giving up trying to hustle for my worthiness. Like that's what I mean by giving things up. But then this idea of like, no, what you're giving up, you'll be, it'll be redeemed, restored. You will be redeemed. You will be restored. I remember hearing the term of like coming back in double portion, you know, all of these things. And it was all so new to me, but it felt like an, like, like an action step more than just a being with it, actively releasing, surrendering, like mm-hmm. surrender, not just as a noun, but as a verb. Yeah. Right. So can you talk to us? A, what does, what does the Bible say about this? What I'm calling like a trade-off? Yeah. You know, I, it's interesting. One time Jesus was having a conversation with the Pharisees who were like the religious leaders of the day. They were like the experts in the law and they were the ones who were trying to find people sinning. You know, they were the who were policing other people's behaviors. It was a, in a religious system. And Jesus is with the tax collectors and the sinners and the Pharisees are watching what's going on. And he, he tells this beautiful sequence of stories. The first one, he tells a story about a shepherd who leaves 99 sheep and goes for the one. He tells a story about a woman who, who is missing a coin, which would have been a part of her dowry, which would have been worn in a headdress. And so it's like, it's like somebody having a, an engagement ring and like scrambling, trying to find, you know, the rock that fell out. And then he tells a story about a father who has two sons and the youngest son comes to his father and says, I need my inheritance, which would have been like telling his dad back in that day, you know, I wish you were dead. And the father does the unthinkable and he gives the inheritance to the son and the son goes and he takes it and he squanders it and he spends it all. It says he spent it on wild living. Well, there was a famine that came in and Jesus is telling this story. 
he said there was a famine that came in and because of the famine the son had nothing and he ended up eating the pods of a pig pen, which you know for a jewish boy like mm-hmm. hanging out with the pigs that's just how low he was yeah. not kosher not kosher <laughs> not bacon yeah. he did like bacon right <laughs> And so he ends up going back home, and when he goes back home the, the, to the father's house, it says the father sees the son, which means he was looking for him. He was a long way off. And the father runs to his son, which in that day for a father to run, was un- it was undignified. But what's Jesus telling us about the father's love, about God's love for us? And the father runs for his son. He wraps him up. He says, my son who is dead is now alive. He was lost, is now found. He said, kill the fatted calf. Let's have a barbecue. He said, put a new ring on his finger, new sandals on his feet, new robe for his back. And he said, my son who was dead is now alive. And then it says there was another son and an older son who was still at the house. And he's, the older son doesn't go into the party. The older son said, well, what about me? Like, I've been here the whole time. And I didn't get a party. And so we don't know how the story ends. That's all Jesus gives us. But when I think about, like, what are we giving up? Well, we're giving up life away from home. You know, what did that younger son, what was he really giving up? Oh, he was giving up pig pods. <laughs> he was giving up trying to figure out, trying to do life apart from, from the father. You know, control, addiction, you know, manipulation, independence mm. from the father. Like, yeah. God wants us to live in a place of dependence right. on him. Yeah, which is so counterintuitive that culturally we hear about like, oh, be an independent woman or ind- and it's this hyper independence and it becomes this stronghold over you where and then you're chasing idols like money and fame and recognition and a certain body type or whatever it is. And you're so far away from your spirit. Yeah. But it's it's coming from this place of that hyper independence and this I can't do it or I, I need to do it on my own. I should be able to do it on my own. And it, it becomes part of your ego or you feel weak or broken if you need help. Whereas, you know, as I've learned, it's like that's a strength of saying, no, I can't do this on my own. I don't want to do this on my own. Right. But again, it gets so flip flopped. Yeah. And I think that what you said, so true, like those idols, you talk like idols, like back in the day, people would worship. They'd worship idols. I mean, we're here in Nashville. We've got the Parthenon and at the Parthenon, there's a there's a statue to Athena. We don't we don't think about idolatry much but like there are idols at the at the mall we I, we drive idols you know an idol is anything that we go to to try to fence, find our sense of worth and yep. value and significance um fitness can be an idol yep. right technology can be an idol work can be an idol anything truly can be can be that and so god came to addiction i mean really that's what addiction is it's it's going to substances and going to things to try to find our deepest needs met and the Bible has a word called repentance and gets a bad rap, I think probably because of TV preachers that have abused it. But what repentance truly means is just come on back home. I just come on back home to who you were made to be. So you can be who you were made to be, so you can do what you were made to do. Yeah. But just come back home, yeah. you know. And it's and, and maybe for some who are listening, that word home needs to be re-imaged. Yeah, you know, sure. Because of the context of the home. But that's what we're all like we all long for that unconditional love we all long for that that place of being known and loved you talked about that that earlier like the longing that we have tim keller talks about it this way he says everybody longs to be known and to be loved he said to be known and not loved is our greatest fear but to be loved and not known that's superficial but to be truly loved and truly known well that's a lot like what god does and that's that place of being at home. And so if I had to describe just the journey of like, what are we giving up? We're giving up life on our own. Mm-hmm. We're giving up life trying to trying to manipulate and control and find our love, joy, and peace in other things and other people and circumstances. And we're going back to that place of complete dependency on, uh, you know, on that where we, where we surrender. Because really that's the way back home to surrender and that is faith i mean it is scary you're leaving a place of certainty for something unknown Um, but if there's anything that i've discovered from those leaps what comes back in its place and i and it's not in a manipulative way it's not like oh god if i would you know turn this over to you will you promise to pay me back it's not like that it's not you're not keeping score or keeping tally 
what I've just discovered is that anything that I've given up, uh-huh. what's been restored or just created, because things can be created that I didn't even know I was looking for. Right. I can't even tell you the fruits that have been, you know, redeemed from that. But part of it, again, is it takes faith to have that faith. You've got to uh-huh. practice it. And it, that's why I said it's that surrender as a verb, not just a noun, because sitting You know, in my house, talking about this idea of surrender and this idea of giving my life over to God was really easy compared to actually doing it, right? Um, And we'll talk about different things on this podcast of, you know, the specificity of that. But when you talk about this idea of coming home, it's like the picture of God that I have that really pleases me (laughs) is God's like, I don't care what you've done. I don't care where you've been. Like, it's not like a conditional come home. It's a come home, period. And go to the picture that Jesus gives us in Luke 15 like the picture is the father running to the son who squandered his inheritance like he squandered it all like yeah. he the runs to a responsibility yes right? Right? he squandered everything yeah. and the father just goes and wraps him up and he's like yeah. and that that is the heart of god no matter where we've been or what we've done or what you know our circumstances and our situation in life has led us to be maybe even the decisions of other people yeah that we would just know god runs to us that he pursues us and that even as we maybe feel like we're kind of turning all it took was one step back home Mm -hmm. you know yeah and and every person listening like you're you're one prayer away from Mm -hmm. beginning that journey yeah to come back home absolutely oh Beautiful. Well, yeah. And really, you know, wherever you are, all we're doing is inviting you to try this story on. And, you know, when I took those three steps for me personally, you know, first trying on that there was a man named Jesus, like in real life, in real time, you know, then learning about his character, his heart, who he had a heart for. And then this, you know, what I'm calling the trade off of what you give up, but what you get back in return that really is immeasurable, right? When I tried on those ideas and I just invested that kind of thought process or that kind of paradigm and put my time and my energy and my heart and my soul using those goggles, but revisiting things like my shame and self-image and my body and my finances and my life's work and how I pour into other women. Because, of course, we're talking about this identity self self, you know, acceptance conversation, which has a whole new meaning when you know and, and are fully seen and known. All of it. When you look at life through those paradigms, everything can shift. And so all we're doing is really inviting you to try on a new story, because if the story that you have right now isn't serving you or isn't making you feel loved, known, seen, there is another story available for you. So would you just speak to that before we wind down this episode? Yeah. You know, it's interesting. You you started talking about putting on another another story and you start talking about trying things on. And I had never heard anybody use that you know use that phrase so you talk about like learning christian you know phrases yeah i um i had never heard that phrase but i think to be able to watch what that you know what that looks like and to be honest i was a little scared of that term because i never i'd never heard it before but i was like you know what to come from where you came from in your show i was like oh it makes so much sense so i would just encourage you know i would encourage like when we talk about trying it on I'm going to go back to that story where the son came home and the father put a rope, put that robe on him, put that ring on him. Like, just try and see if it, see if it fits Mm -hmm. and see if it fits and uh, let that, that new identity and, um, and who God says you are in him. Like, just take that next, just continue taking that next step and see if it fits. So. So beautiful. I love it. I love it. Well, if you love this conversation, Buckle up because we have another conversation coming at you next week. I know for me, the the believing side of it, there was all of these beliefs that were like, okay, this all sounds great in theory, but am I too broken? Am I too far gone? No, you don't understand. My shame is worse off than the other people's shame, whatever it was. Fill in the blank. There's so many beliefs that keep us from either having or starting a relationship with God. And we are going to talk about those head on. Kevin is going to be back next week as well. So stay tuned for that. And this is Leanne signing off for another episode of What's God Got to Do With It. 
We'll be back with more What's God Got to Do With It. But in the meantime, I would love to hear from you. So tell me about where you are in your story and what questions you have. You know, where do you feel you need clarity or wisdom in your own journey? I definitely want to hear from you. So head on over to what's God got to do with it.com and scroll down to the form to share your thoughts, questions, or feedback instantly. That's what's God got to do with it.com. And if you like this podcast and want to hear more, follow, like, and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts to get your weekly dose of what's God got to do with it. New episodes drop every single Tuesday. And while you're there, be sure to rate and review to show your support. It really means so much. What's God Got to Do With It is an iHeartRadio podcast on the Amy Brown Podcast Network. It's written and hosted by me, Leanne Ellington. Executive produced by Elizabeth Fazio. Post-production and editing by Houston Tilly. And original music written by Cheryl Stark and produced by Adam Stark. Zero Foxtrot isn't just a brand. It's a way of life. Founded and operated by veterans, Zero Foxtrot's unique apparel and gear echoes the grit of the warrior culture. Zero Foxtrot dedicates itself to producing content, honoring the sacrifices of forgotten heroes of the past, and connecting history to the present. Embark on a journey with Zero Foxtrot today at ZeroFoxtrot.com. It's not merely our products. It's about the ethos that we embody. Rugged, resilient, and timeless. Good sleep should come naturally, and with the new Natural Hybrid mattress, it can. A collaboration between Lisa and West Elm, the Natural Hybrid is expertly crafted from natural latex, natural wool, and certified safe foams to elevate your sleep sanctuary and support a greener tomorrow. Plus, every purchase helps fuel Lisa's work with shelters and those in need. Don't put off a good night's sleep any longer. Get a Lisa mattress today for a sound sleep tonight. Visit lisa.com slash iHeart. That's l-e-e-s-a dot com slash I heart. You know that feeling when you walk into your home, take a deep breath, and feel new? Well, that's what it's like to use Clorox Sentiva. Because Clorox Sentiva smells like coconut, cleans like Clorox, and feels like energy. It'll elevate any cleaning routine to not just clean, but also make every room smell like a tropical coconut getaway. Discover how Clorox Sentiva's powerful clean and refreshing scents can transform your space. Get yours in Coconut or other fabulous scents at a nearby retail store. Viking. Committed to exploring the world in comfort. Journey through the heart of Europe on an elegant Viking longship with thoughtful service, cultural enrichment, and all-inclusive fares. Discover more at Viking.com.